What about that great unexplored continent at the bottom of our Earth? Scientific investigations of the Earth and its relationships in the universe are currently reaching a new high. From a spacecraft, man can see the roundness of the Earth. His eyes can trace its lakes and oceans and the shape of the green lands of its continents. From that far out point, in sharp contrast to the greens and blues of land and water, he can note the stark whiteness of the ice-capped polar regions. The Antarctic, exposed to fierce winds, is surrounded by ice most of the year. Remove the ice from the bottom of the world, and there remains a large continental land area. The answer lies here, in Antarctica, where vast amounts of frozen water are locked up in ice. Is that we have an, in, a, a, an envir a global environmental disaster of virtually uh, unprecedented uh, dimensions, building fairly quickly to a point where human civilization will almost certainly experience uh, very large impacts in the next century. And that's, that's, that's what the scientific evidence points toward. We do not have, in this case, some kook on a street corner waving a placard saying the end of the world is coming. We have top scientists advising society that unless certain steps are taken, we are going to have very serious problems. An increase in global sea level, there is concern uh, on a somewhat longer time scale about the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet and uh, a general rise of uh, many, many meters in, uh, in sea level. But I will be considering the possibility that the West Antarctic ice sheet could melt. Attention is focused on the West Antarctic ice sheet and the possibility that it could change. It could respond rather rapidly to, to changes imposed on it or al also possibly to internal instabilities that exist within it. The weak sun has little effect on the ice, which is piled up for centuries. If we melted this ice, all the seven seas would rise 200 feet. The seaports of the world would be drowned. The Antarctic continent itself, with the awful weight of ice removed, would rise 700 feet. There are really two parts of Antarctica that aren't really all that similar. They are separated by the Transantarctic Mountains here that go from one side of the continent to the other. Over here, the large part is called East Antarctica, and it's covered almost entirely by the East Antarctic Ice Sheet, a continuous mass of ice, very thousands of kilometers in extent. And this part then is called the West, it's called West Antarctica. This is the Antarctic Peninsula. From here you go on up to South America. West Antarctica, which by contrast is a series of islands covered in ice, much of which is actually sitting on the floor of the Southern Ocean, not on dry land. A large portion of Antarctica, in particular in West Antarctica, is actually below sea level. If the ice should melt, it would raise the sea level enough to flood every major seaport and all the low-lying lands of the Earth. There's a lot of ice locked up in the ice sheets, about 56 meters of uh, sea level ice equivalent. If all of Antarctica melts and if all of Greenland melts, the sea level goes up 240 feet compared to what it is now. So while the underlying bedrock looks like this, the actual terrain is two to three kilometers higher and is made up of glaciers and ice shelves. But science is now frantically trying to catch up with a situation that's kind of quietly crept up on our Earth's environment. What we do know is that these glaciers are retreating far more quickly than we previously thought. What we don't know is whether we've got years or decades or centuries to prepare for it. Somewhat novel simulation where they introduce different types of uh, ice stabilities, in particular there's this marine ice cliff instability in the simulation, which, you know, the dynamics of that are fairly uncertain, not implausible that much of West Antarctica could be lost under different climate change scenarios. The more these scientists can find out about the dynamics of these truly gigantic structures, the better chance we have of preparing and adapting to the changes that their potential disintegration could bring. How far will the seas rise and when? The disintegration of ice sheets 
is likely to be highly nonlinear. Not a question of will sea level rise a large amount. It's only a question of how fast that will occur. These changes are staggering. We actually don't have any idea how fast some of these systems can react to climate warming. What the past 20 years of data are showing us, it's they are reacting fast. How fast these glaciers will collapse is one of the most important scientific questions. So we don't know, and, and they, but this is the kind of question we would ask. How do we figure out what kind of speed is, is ultimately attainable? And, and this bears on what kind of, you know, what sort of disintegration could really possibly take place. If you could have an instability like that, that would throw the thing would go faster and faster, then and suppose you could have a speed of 100 meters a day, you can move the ice out of the West Antarctic ice sheet remarkably fast that way. You could, you could get rid of that ice in the order of decades. We still um, are potentially underestimating the instability of the ice sheets. The melting of Antarctica is accelerating at an alarming rate. Most of the glaciers of West Antarctica were retreating and also that their retreat was speeding up. Antarctica, a continent of snow and ice, is now losing ice three times faster than it was in 2007. Polar ice sheets in Greenland are melting at five times the pace of just a few years ago. Scientists say Antarctica's ice is melting six times faster than it was 40 years ago. So right now, sea level is rising, rising about 30 centimeters per century, but we know there's the possibility that it could uh, do this 10 times faster because it did that in the past. Clues about the speed of future sea level rise are found during the time of the last ice age. As global temperatures rose, the planet's ice sheets melted into the sea. Sea levels increased by a staggering 390 feet until they settled at today's levels. How fast did this happen? The answer may help predict how quickly sea levels could rise in the next century and how much time we have to defend our coasts. There's one particular sea level rise of interest. We call it Meltwater Pulse 1A. During that period of time, we believe sea level rose about 20 meters in 500 years, or about four to five meters per 100 years. Meltwater Pulse 1A, about 14,000 years ago, where sea level was rising four meters per century, and it did that for four centuries. And that corresponded to the collapse of the northern ice sheets, uh, also some parts of Antarctica. We know that in the Earth's history, when ice sheets have uh, collapsed and sea level has gone up, we've had sea level rise of several meters in a century. So now, with humans changing the composition of the atmosphere much faster than it ever was changed in the past, there's no reason to think that that couldn't happen again. Scientists predict the sea level will rise at least a meter within the next hundred years, up to five or six meters within three centuries. Those rates could accelerate if land-supported portions of the Antarctic ice cap were to melt into the ocean. The literature stops at 2100, and this is one of the few cases now where they let the science, the models they produce, keep running. It doesn't stop at whatever sea level you get. Ramsdorf was saying here, oh, we might get a meter, we might get a three-foot sea level rise by 2100. Now, that doesn't sound too bad, except then go to 2200 and see what happens and then 2,300 and 2,400. Because the way CO2 is going up and the way the models start building, once you start melting the ice, even if you start cutting down emissions and changing CO2, you've built heat into the system and they just are off and running on their own little melting life. And so this is where the scary part comes in. Once you unleash this monster, it doesn't shut down and it accelerates. Global sea level now is expected to rise if we're lucky, four feet by 2100. And if you accumulate all this acceleration from the land ice, you see that it's accelerating at 440 gigatons per year per decade. And if you extrapolate that to the end of the century, we raise sea level by 80 centimeters. So you could argue that we are already on a trajectory of a one meter per century uh, sea level rise if this trend continues. This is clearly faster than any models that have been used so far to make sea level projection. Thermal expansion. Thermal expansion of the ocean. It turns out that if you heat up the ocean, 
uh, it, it expands just a little bit, just enough to rise a little bit. Uh, when you combine the thermal expansion of the ocean with the uh, melting of ice that's on land right now, you could have substantial uh, sea level rise all over the world. The ocean has warmed, it's got heat in it. The thermal expansion, when you warm water, the molecules spread out a little bit further. There's three feet of rise going to happen if nothing else in the world happens. If we can shut off every bit of CO2 in the atmosphere right now, it's still going to go up three feet. This is the long-term sea level curve that we see here, and we're looking at relative levels, and we can see 120 million years ago, 100 million years ago, 80 million years ago, these are when these Antarctic rocks were present. But from about 70 million years ago to the present day, the long-term trend has been dropping sea level, just as the long-term trend has been increasing the amount of ice at both poles. And over this long, slow cooling of the planet, we have watched the level of our ocean drop, and this is meters, 300 feet of drop from a Cretaceous time down to the present day. So this is long-term change. So this is a much more uh, aggressive estimate of what uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere might look like, uh, but the important thing here is that almost all the ice from West Antarctica uh, has been lost. This is for 2,500, would be about 15 meters of sea level rise. When the climate of the planet was about half a degree warmer than present, or maybe just the same as present, right, during the last interglacial, sea level was six to nine meters higher. Right? That means the marine part of Greenland was gone, West Antarctica was gone, and some part of East Antarctica, Antarctica yet to be identified was gone as well. The last time it was two to three degrees Celsius warmer than it is now, sea level was about 25 meters higher. That's 80 feet. East Antarctica, which was uh, until, until recently viewed as uh, the more stable part of, uh, of Antarctica. What you can see is we looked at our bay that we've been looking at and compared it against glacier basins across East Antarctica. And what these colors show in these circles is just how much their rates of loss have increased since 2008. Vincennes Bay in particular has been losing elevation at about five times the rate it was losing in 2008. The Totem Glacier, which on its own uh, holds a 3.5 meter sea level rise, it's retreating at 200 meters per year. It's hopefully protected by a prograde slope upstream, so it's going to be difficult for this glacier to retreat fast. But in 2016, uh, the Australians found the presence of warm water in front that explained the retreat of these glaciers. 2016 was the first time we had measurements of the temperature in front of this glacier. So the reason we care about East Antarctic glaciers so much, and if we see them changing, is that they're grounded basically below sea levels. They are holding back the, bit, the ice that's in the Aurora and Wilkes subglacial basins, which are two of the biggest subglacial basins in Antarctica. Together, they hold about 28 meters sea level rise, which is about four Greenlands. East Antarctic ice sheet, the one that is really considered very stable, uh, they have uh, been lost in the Pliocene. In the Pliocene era, some three to five million years ago, atmospheric levels of CO2 were similar to those humans are seeing today. From the East Antarctic ice sheet, there was that contributed an extra 10 meters of global sea level. So in total, you were looking at between 20 and 22 meters higher than they are today. Now that wouldn't happen instantly, but we could get several meters of sea level rise in one century. If it continues to double at the rate that it has in the last decade, then we could get within 50 years meter scale sea level rise. And you would rapidly, within another one or two decades, get multimeter sea level rise. And it's these center areas of the oceans, the mid-ocean ridges, when more heat comes, they expand upward. And as they expand upward, the very volume of the oceans decreases and water is pushed on land. But at the same time, if the, the tectonic processes that cause seafloor spreading and continental drift slow down, if the amount of heat that causes this mid-ocean ridge to spread further apart, when that heat decreases, the rocks cool, the rocks unswell, if you will, and sink further down, and the ocean basins becomes bigger. Water falls off the continents. Sea level drops away. But this is really slow. Nothing happens with any speed. But if you want to have rapid sea level change, it's the middle one. You take continental ice caps and you melt them, or you freeze them to a greater extent. And the rate at which sea level can go up and down is way faster than the tectonic processes. Then the water from the ocean is able to get in, the theory goes, under the ice shelf, 
which calves away the ice shelf and that then you lose the protection for the ice sheet then you start calving that away there's um, some suggestions that that's what happened in the final stages of the North American ice cap over Hudson's Bay that the ice cap uh, that, that the final ice there was calved away in a time period of like a hundred years because of the water being able to get in underneath. And there are four major circulation features. The really the dominant one uh, is this eastward current here. It goes from west to east all the way around Antarctica. Is the Antarctic circumpolar current. The heat in the Antarctic is contained in the Antarctic circumpolar current, which is part of the global thermal online circulation. So how does that change in a warmer climate? Pushed by the westerly winds, the rest of the world is warming up faster. So you have a greater temperature differential between Antarctica and the rest of the world. And that makes the winds around the Antarctic stronger. At the Antarctic margins, you tend to have winds coming from the east to the west, and that gives rise to a surface transport that is actually onshore. And because of the Coriolis force, they tend to push the surface waters to the left in the southern hemisphere, and the warm water towards the south, towards the glaciers, and melt the glaciers even faster. And we know this started to happen uh, to deviate from the natural variability around the 80s. So in the traditional book of glaciology, you learn that glaciers waste their ice by calving iceberg in the ocean. But what we discovered, it's what's happening with the ocean underneath. And in fact, when we look at uh, what's happening in, around Antarctica and around Greenland, but especially around Antarctica, we become very concerned because what we see is that the ice shelves are melting. The, ocean is getting warmer at depth and melting the ice shelves, the tongues of ice that come out from the ice sheet into the ocean and which buttress the ice sheet. Those are melting. The flow of the ice, the red areas here are flowing faster than the green and brown areas and you see the branches of the glaciers that are reaching hundreds to a thousand kilometers inland and pulling ice. As they as they melt, that allows the ice from the ice sheet to be discharged more rapidly into the ocean. If you want to change an ice sheet rapidly, you have to change the flow of these ice streams. In the tropics or even in the coastal areas around here, we have warm water at the top and cold water at the bottom. In the polar ocean, it's the opposite. We have warm water at depth and cold water at the top. Sinking of heavy, salty, cold water near the Antarctic coast normally forms Antarctic bottom water thus also bringing relatively warm water to the surface where it releases heat to the atmosphere and space. But now, as fresh meltwater from Antarctic ice shelves increases, it tends to put a cold, low-density lid on the Southern Ocean. This reduces exchange with the surface, so the heat stays in the ocean, raising the temperature of ocean water at the depth of ice shelves. And the warm water, salty water, is a very efficient melting of, uh, of the glacier. The freezing point of seawater is at minus two degrees at the surface, and when you put that water at depth, the freezing point becomes minus 3.5 degrees versus zero degrees for the, for the freshwater ice. So there's plenty of heat to melt the ice at depth. And amplifying feedback. Uh, what you see is that there's pretty much circumpolar warming, okay? And the rates are relatively large, okay? So you're looking here in this orange and yellow. Uh, it's roughly something like a tenth of a degree per decade, okay? So say 0.01 uh, degrees C per year. It's a very strong signal of warming in the Southern Ocean. The temperature at the seafloor around the Antarctic margins. And again, you see two very different pictures here around most of East Antarctica and the Weddell Sea you have a seafloor temperature that's relatively cold, so this is this cold water regime, and then all the way around West Antarctica, you actually have warm water, okay? So this is places where warm water is actually penetrating onto the shelf. But what happens when these ice shells begin to float is that there is a region underneath that ice shelf, okay, that is obviously flooded by the ocean, we call this cavity, and there is a circulation within that cavity, okay? So we have water coming onto the shelf, circulating under this cavity. And eventually at some point, that ice will actually lift off the bedrock and will actually begin to float. And this is what we call these marine ice shelves that ring the margins of Antarctica. So of course it's important to know if the ice sheet is grounded below sea level or not, because if it's below sea level, the ocean can melt the ice. But the slope of the bed is also important. And a uh, simple model show that for a normal slope, uh, going uphill uh, in the inland direction, 
if you disturb the glacier from equilibrium, it will find a, a new stable state very easily. But if it's on a reverse slope, there's only two stable states. Either the glacier reaches the edge of the continental shelf, or it becomes a floating ice shelf, which means that if you disrupt the glacier from a stabilizing position because of a bump or some topographic features, in this configuration, it starts retreating along a retrograde slope. You cannot stop it. So this is the map of the bed beneath the ice sheet in Greenland and Antarctica, and everything that's in blue is below sea level. That means if the ice retreats in that area, the ocean will follow it through and melt the ice continuously. And some of these sectors have a retrograde slope, which is conducive to fast retreat. Pine Island Glacier sector in the Amazon Sea, where you have these glaciers here, the Pine Island, the Twaits Glacier. These are big monsters, by the way. This is 30 kilometers wide. Twaits Glacier is 120 kilometers wide, right? between Philadelphia and New York, more or less. This is Twaits Glacier. All of these glaciers, flowing about four kilometers per year, are speeding up in concert. They are responding to the warm temperature of the ocean. In some years where it's a bit colder, they flow a little bit less. Warmer years, they flow a little bit more. We map a lot of the topography beneath these glaciers. We follow their evolution, and in 2014, we concluded there's not enough bumps in the back of these glaciers to stop the ongoing retreat, and we see it as an irreversible retreat of the West Antarctic ice sheet. The discovery of volcanoes beneath the Antarctic ice sheet means that there is an additional source of heat to melt the ice, lubricate its passage toward the sea, and add to the melting from warm ocean waters. It will be important to include this in our efforts to estimate whether the Antarctic ice sheet might become unstable if you've got thinning ice cover over a volcanic region. There is every reason to suggest it will increase the volcanism as the pressure exerted on the mantle by the glacier decreases and allows more heat to escape. This could cause a feedback loop in which the melt rate continues to increase. When you're on the crater, is that the lava lake could explode at any time. In a global perspective, cold freshwater lenses around Antarctica increase the planet's energy imbalance. The added energy goes into the ocean where it is available to melt ice shell. These feedbacks support our conclusion that melt in response to strong forcing will be nonlinear. Antarctic mass loss most melting so far is ice shelves, which does not show up in gravity satellite measurements of mass change. However, as ice shelves disappear, the discharge of the non-floating ice will accelerate. If ice sheet mass loss has a 10-year doubling time, meter scale sea level rise would be reached in about 50 years, and multimeter sea level rise a decade later. 20-year doubling time would require about 100 years. The data records are too short. But if we wait until the real world reveals itself clearly, it may be too late to avoid sea level rise of several meters and loss of all coastal cities. The possibility has been raised that the Antarctic ice sheet may in some sense collapse or disintegrate or sometimes they say melt down and uh, if it were to do that, it would have substantial uh, consequences for uh, human activity elsewhere in the Earth. The other things that I think people don't fully appreciate is what happens when, when the warming begins and the ice caps begin to melt and the level of the oceans begin to rise. Many of the world's major cities are, are, are coastal cities. Even though these ice sheets may seem far and remote and irrelevant to us, they're actually rising sea level faster in the mid-latitude regions than they do in the tropics. There would be so many refugees from China, for example, has more than 300 million people living within 20 meters of sea level. Damage doesn't start at six to nine meters sea level rise, right? The damage on us starts at about a meter sea level rise. With a meter sea level rise, a lot of the counties around the U.S. will be affected and people will have to move infrastructure or move themselves like nuclear power plant are at risk, airports, navy bases. Even a small rise would be enough to endanger low-lying shore areas. When sea goes up four and a half feet vertically on a you know, nice sloping beach, it obviously goes quite a distance uh, horizontally as well. But what you don't see here is the fact that salt water goes sideways through soil really fast. And crops can't grow in soil that has salt put in it.
On average, an increase of an inch in sea level means an encroachment of sea on land of six feet or more. This figure is for an ideal average coast. Flat lands such as these two will be flooded much farther inland. The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change estimating that a three-foot rise in sea levels would submerge nearly a quarter of a million miles of the world's coastlines, seriously threaten low-lying urban areas, flood productive land, contaminate fresh water supplies, and destroy many coastal wetlands. Vastly more beach erosion. Uh, there would, uh, many rivers might back up with salt water and communities that take fresh, what now is fresh water from rivers might find that they're uh, Drinking water is becoming briny because the ocean is backing into their river. Uh, people who uh, tap aquifers for fresh water might find the aquifers are being contaminated by uh, salt water. There are just a number of effects. Uh, wetlands uh, suddenly become, in effect, ocean, and uh, the birds don't have any new wetlands to go to, and wildlife is disrupted. There are just any number of effects from sea level rise. And many communities, particularly in the third world, have millions of people living right on the coast, right within just feet of sea level. Bangladesh is usually brought up as the key example. Imagine, for instance, that the seas rise on the coasts of Bangladesh and Guyana, which are particularly at risk. So the Band-Aid solution is to adapt, right? Uh, and even move or protect. Holding off the sea would be the major employer of the world by 2100. Massive levees to defend our coastlines. In the societies that can afford to protect, we will protect. In societies that can't, they don't have the technology of the money, we will have to move. And the cost of doing all of this, of course, escalates in an exponential fashion with sea level. Bangladesh, which lies in the unstable deltas of three major and unpredictable rivers, already experiences disastrous and repeated river flooding. In 1987, 40% of Bangladesh's area was flooded, the worst such experience on record, until 1988, when the flooded area reached 62%. Worse still are the cyclones and storm surges from the Bay of Bengal. 300,000 of Bangladesh's people died there in 1970 in such a seawater flooding. Those high winds cause a storm surge at the exact moment of high tide, causing a six meter high wall of water that just obliterates. Tens of thousands more in 1985. 110 million people live in Bangladesh, 80 million of them in threatened areas. Uncontrolled sea level rising can obliterate their homeland just about entirely. So what's really going to happen here is that Bangladesh, which can feed itself right now, won't be able to feed itself with a five-foot sea level rise. And we're going to have four feet by 2100. So we're looking at 112 million people that's expected to be 150 million by that time that can't feed themselves. So where are they going to go? Because people are going to go to feed their kids. Well, they're going to go into India. Do you think the Indians are going to let that happen? No. This is the problem. This is why our security agencies are pretty, pretty worried about global warming. Because if you want the cause of human conflict, make it so you can't feed your kids and that that next country has places where you can. Mass human migrations on enormous scales are a possibility if we continue to cause sea level to rise. The most catastrophic threat to coastal areas, which is from a probable increase in storms and thus of storm flooding. In hurricanes and typhoons, which are the same extreme weather phenomenon under different names, the low barometric pressure at the heart of the storm actually pulls the water level up. As meteorologists describe it, a fall of one millibar in atmospheric pressure raises the sea level by almost half an inch. In a recent Shanghai typhoon, the resulting rise in sea level coming up onto the land, greatly aided by the strong storm winds, amounted to 22 feet. In the probable worst storms of the global warming, such storm surges can be confidently expected to be even larger. So the coastlines of the planet, where a third of the world's cropland is located and where more than a billion human beings live, will be at considerable risk, if not from permanent flooding, at least from devastating storm surges, especially around some shores with steep bluffs, where a sea level rise means there will be deeper water near the land, which means the waves will be higher and more damaging. Even miles from the coast, people who live along tidal rivers will share the risk. That is London's situation, which has already forced its people to build great mechanical barriers just downstream of the city. Inhabitants of cities which draw their drinking water from partially tidal rivers will experience saltwater pollution of their water supplies 
as the brine-laden tidal bores reach farther and farther upstream from the sea, while those whose water supplies come from underground aquifers will find the salt seeping into those as well. Increasing storms will certainly flood the coastal areas more often. Ultimately, many parts of Florida may be permanently drowned under shallow seas. The Mississippi Delta is also highly vulnerable. New York City may need Dutch-style dikes to protect at least lower Manhattan. Boston may need the same. This is a holy shit moment. That's not holy shit. It's worse than that. It's worse than holy shit. We're not ready for this. So, we can't let that happen. We can't let the ice sheets uh, disintegrate and sea level rise many meters. It's just, it would make... Um, it, it seems hard to imagine how they, the planet would be governable if we get such uh, dramatic changes because the economic consequences and the social consequences would be enormous. So we clearly need to avoid a commitment to a multiple sea level, uh, sea level rise. And I think we've seen enough uh, in the climate change signal in what the glaciers do to say we don't want to go there. We don't want to run the experiment until the patient dies. Right? And the time is to do that, is to do now, to transition to a carbon-free energy. It's available, it's economically viable. The challenge is to do that rapidly and to do it worldwide, which means that countries who don't have this technology should have access to this technology as well. We need to curb our greenhouse gas emission, uh, but even that, in my opinion, is not going to be enough. It's, of course, the first major step to do that. But we already passed some threshold for some of these ice sheets. So if we really want to bring it to a level where sea level is not rising because of melting land ice, we're going to have to deal with the extra carbon that we already put in the atmosphere and need to sequester back into the ground. This is the greatest challenge humanity has ever faced. 